In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, normally, I like preaching on the Old Testament because we don't know much about the Old Testament. But when we have a reading like today, I think it's important to address the beheading of John the Baptist. And some people wonder why there is so much violence in the Bible. It's kind of shocking. And some even use it as a reason not to believe the truth that is encoded in the Bible, the truth of these stories. But there's actually a wonderful thing about even terrible stories in the Bible. The stories of God's relationship with God's people don't skip the hard stuff, the ugly stuff. It signifies, actually, that God is present in our own world, in the daily realities of hardship and struggle and sometimes unimaginable unimaginable violence. As we see throughout the scriptures as well, violence almost always has a political motivation, which is typically you have the stuff or the power that I want, or you threaten the stuff and the power that I have. And this arc repeats itself over and over throughout scripture and of course is present in our lives today. Well, what would our founding texts tell us about God if it was nothing but joy and love, no struggle or pain? What a distance this would put between God and our lives. If we had no stories of blood or pain or political calculation or political violence, it would be easy to think that God is not present in our world because we don't see those things in the texts that show us what God is to us throughout the ages. But as, in, as it is, in Genesis, like immediately, unflinchingly, explains the challenges of living together. Cain kills Abel. In the, in the story, we have Adam and Eve and their children. One of them kills another. So there's something about this violence that is important for us to know. It puts before us the question of human relationship. Am I my brother's keeper? And God answers, the voice of Abel's blood cries out from the ground. That is a thundering affirmative. Ours is a God, remember, who was crucified, who watched his son be crucified. And that crucifixion was performed by the Roman state. Jesus was a political prisoner imprisoned and killed because his message threatened the power of the church authorities, the religious authorities, and the political power of Herod in Rome. John the Baptist's death today foreshadows the fate of Jesus and readies the soul for the triumph of resurrection. And to be honest, it, it's easy in today's world to ignore uh, you know, where we live, to ignore the wars and the violence that continue raging all around the globe. Though America may be relatively safe from large-scale wars at this time, many of God's people are constantly under threat. Haiti, for example, there's literally, literally no government in an entire country right now. No order, no basic safety. Please pray for our brothers and sisters there and in similar situations across the world. And of course, in our own country is pockmarked with violence against innocent people. So it's comforting, actually, 
that our scriptures include even heinous acts of state-sanctioned violence. It's natural that God's story would include political realities of the day because politics are how we organize the basic elements of living together. The gospel, we believe this, the gospel then and now has something to say not just to us as individuals, but has something to say about the world around us. This isn't just for our individual benefit. It is the light that shines the truth on the whole of our world. It is, as Amos would say, a plumb line with which to mark, measure, and build a life in God. We have any St. Joe's folks in the house? Plumb lines? Some construction people? Anybody? We gave a shout out to the lawyers last time I was up. No, it was the economists. Doctors, lawyers, economists. But we do not shy away from the harsh realities like the beheading of John the Baptist. Beheadings happen today, just not here. Herod, who's responding to his daughter's titillating dance, and that's what that was, by the way. That was a sensual, alluring, sexualized dance. And Herod is responding to this. And he says, I will give you whatever you want. And her mother tells her to request John's head on a platter. And so Herod, not wanting to break his oath or to disappoint his guests, obliges. And the stark contrast here is intentional. You have this wild, racy party for the elites with beguiling dancers and wine flowing, and you know that Herod was probably deep in his cups when he makes this promise to his daughter. And then on the other side, we have John, who's chained up and languishing in prison. But did you catch this? John has this unique relationship with Herod. See, Herod fears John's righteousness and holiness, but he's perplexed. And it's so interesting that they kept this in here. They, they, they added it intentionally. He is interested in what John has to say. Herod is interested in what John has to say. He says he liked listening to him. So there's some kind of affinity for this truth teller John who's in prison. And I believe it's because John was slowly introducing Herod to a different kingdom, a different way of being. And Herod may have been longing, like so many who worship at the altar of power, for a deeper peace and a fuller meaning to the living of a life. Maybe he knew, as most people do, deep down, that the debaucherous life is hollow, that the frivolous life is hollow. Maybe he suspected in his quiet moments alone that opulence and wealth and power never satisfy. And yet when he's forced, when Herod is forced to choose between his own oath and the expectations of his guests at a party, versus the life of this man who is righteous and holy, who has a sort of budding relationship with Herod, Herod takes the easy way out. He preserves his own honor and political authority by taking the life of a prophet, a righteous and holy man, in gruesome fashion. The head of John the Baptist on a platter the last course of the banquet. Now in the Old Testament, Amos also sees a choice before us. Speaking to an Israelite people, again, not an individual, but the people Israel, who have turned from God. He carries God's words in his mouth and he says, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people. The high places will be made desolate. 
The sanctuary shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. This is God talking. These are the consequences of abandoning God for worldly power. For those who misuse power and ignore the call of love for all, there is always a reversal coming, and you cannot outrun it. And how does the high priest respond? This is classic, right? He, he doesn't want to hear it. He tells Jeroboam, Amos is conspiring against you. And this is a beautiful phrase. The land is not able to bear his words. Go away. Prophesy to Judah. Make your money over there. But this is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple for his kingdom. You know, the truth is a very hard thing to hear. The call of worldly power, of material wealth, of accumulation, of individual prosperity, disconnection between our brothers and sisters is so strong that it can lead to gruesome violence or just a gradual slinking away from love a slouching into the despair of an unexamined life, like the slow ebb of a tide. And after a while, you realize that you're much further away than you thought you were. But for us here, for the people who live in the belief of the kingdom of God, that the kingdom has indeed come near, that Jesus is the way of love. Now, we're not the plumb line. That's the mistake Amaziah and Herod made. We do not build the house of truth and love alone. When we renew our baptismal vows, we say what? I will with God's help. But what a profound blessing it is for which many, like John, gave their lives that amid the violence and chaos of this world, we have a plumb line in Jesus, love incarnate, who reverses the injustice and transforms violence into peace. The final word of life is not brutishness or sorrow, but the transcendence of Jesus gathering the brokenness into the divine embrace of healing. As the psalmist says today, I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Righteousness shall go before him and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. Amen.